Hello everyone, I'm Justice Graves. I'm currently running to be a member of the School Committee for the Narragansett Regional School District here in Templeton in Phillipson, Massachusetts. But today we are going to not focus so much on my campaign, but on something that is much more important, which is much more applicable to different situations that are going on. I have been jumping up and down lately on this channel and with regards to different platforms that I'm on about what the Department of Education is doing with its proposed rule, American History and Civics Education. Now a proposed rule goes through what is called the federal rulemaking process, and that is what this video today is about, so that you can understand how a federal regulation, which is essentially a law, how they get created, and how they become law without Congress, the judicial branch, or anybody else ever interacting just through the executive branch. So we're going to talk about that if you were ever curious about that. I'm going to, this is in a PowerPoint-like presentation, I'm going to switch over so that way you can see it. Today's video is titled The Federal Rulemaking Process. I'm going to present on it. There are links in the description if you want to find out more information, but let's just get started really quickly. So what are the basics of how this process works? So under the Administration Procedure Act of 1946, which happened during the time of FDR, and it's also called the APA, federal agencies, such as cabinet level departments, have the power to create new regulations, i.e. laws, without Congress under specific branching pathways and different series of events. And we're going to talk about that process. Regulations carry the force of law. Congress and SCOTUS can eliminate all or part of a regulation. And this is because of Congress's enumerated powers under the Constitution, also because of the Congressional Review Act of 1996, which we will also talk about in this particular video, and because of the powers of judicial review that SCOTUS has under Marbury versus Madison. So just be aware of that. A regulation can also be undone with a new regulation that must follow this entire process over again. Another interesting part about this process, if at any point a regulation fails, it gets rejected by Congress or something happens with the judicial branch, the cabinet that proposed it cannot propose any new regulation that is similar or the same as the regulation that got booted out. So just be aware of that. A regulation dies completely when that happens, when Congress or SCOTUS take an action either in the courts or if in Congress. So just be aware of this. So this is the technical overview. There are 10 steps to how this process works, how the rulemaking process works. And I'm gonna you know, start off by telling you which one's which. So first it starts with statutory authorization. Then the rulemaking process begins in step number two. The rule is prepared in step number three. Then there's regulatory, regulatory analysis and review, which is step four. Then there are five sub-steps that can happen within step five, which is the notice and comment process. And we're gonna go over that in detail. There's the post comment internal review for step six. Seven is the review outcome. Eight is congressional review. Step nine is judicial review and step 10 is interpretation, enforcement and reassessment. So let's get right into it. What does statutory authorization mean? A statute has to exist that allows the agency the ability to solve their problem or accomplished goal. Different organizations or agencies such as the Department of Education or the Department of Energy cannot make rules without a statute that authorizes it. That is important. And that authority is given by Congress and by the presidency. So be aware of this. If the agency can make a new rule, meaning that a statute exists which allows it, they can begin the rulemaking process, which is what we're talking about. This is step one that they have to check to see if they have the power for it. Laws exist that can also direct federal agencies how to create their rules. But the most powerful and overarching rule that authorizes and sort of, you know, is the procedure that we're talking about is the Administration Procedure Act of 1946, which is what we are talking about exclusively. Other statutes which authorize the ability for an agency to do any type of new rulemaking can have other steps included in them. But most, if not all, stick to this basic formula. So that's really important to understand. 
We will talk about where we'll talk about where exceptions may come up, but we're not going to talk about anything super specific department level right now or agency level. Step two, the rulemaking process begins. So an agency has to determine through an existing statute and law what problems it can address, and this is determined by a number of factors. Congressional oversight, the different committees can oversight what different federal agencies are doing and can tell them what they can and cannot do. There are presidential directives. The president directs what his federal agencies and cabinet level members do and what they proceed with. Different lawsuits can determine whether a rule will be made or not. Advice from an advisory committee that is authorized usually by Congress or by the presidency. Petitions from the public, although that's rare. Internal judgments and adjudication in some cases when a rulemaking process begins, there is immediately a judicial oversight over it, depending on which agency and under which statute that is authorized under. So just be aware of that. And when I say authorizing statute, authorizing statute means the law in which an agency is able to make a proposed change. Be aware of that. Part three or step three, you have to prepare the proposed rule. The agency has to prepare it. And it has to prepare it through collecting information, creating a background of information or sources that it is citing. It has to create a formal, in certain cases, it may jump immediately from this step to formal public participation, which starts the notice and comment phase, which is extremely important. When this happens, this is called an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, just so that you understand the language. It just means that we're jumping immediately into step five, we're skipping step four. There's also negotiated rulemaking, which can actually also be a fast-tracked measure, but it depends on if the rule interacts with other agencies or other congressional oversight committees. So please be aware of that, that during this whole process, agencies, if their rules affect other agencies and other oversight committees have to get involved, they do, and everybody has that conversation. Part four, or step four, is the regulatory analysis and review. If a proposed rule is economically significant, Costs and benefits have to be predicted. So there is this Office of Information and Regulator Affairs, or the OIRA, or ORI, or ORA. That is under the direct purview of the presidency. So in the end, the president basically authorizes every single regulation that goes through his administration through his federal agencies. So be aware of that. That is the last step for the OIRA to go to the president and explain the situation. And that office has to be explained why cheaper solutions are not being sought out or why certain solutions are being sought out. If the rule requires gathering information from the public, ORI must also be granted, must also grant that permission. And the agency has to predict the has to predict the rule's impact on all areas of public life and create documentation on that. This also often results when this step happens, Congress will take steps if it's favorable to prepare budgetary items or budgetary acts that will affect the budget in preparation for when that act passes, because they'll assume that it will pass, that the new regulation will become law. For example, the Civic Secures Democracy Act that was introduced on March 11th of 2021 is, ha is for the explicit purpose of being able to fund the proposed rule by the DO, by the Department of Ed, the American History and Civics Education proposed rule. So be aware of that. If you're seeing things introduced in Congress which allocate new funds that allow agencies to use those funds, it's because there's a new regulation on the horizon that they expect will pass. So be aware of that. Step five is the notice and comment process, which has five sub-steps, which is why we are, this nice little intro is here. So step 5.1 is the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which is an NPRM. This has to be published in the Federal Register. And this document has to include the specific statutes that authorize the rule, aka the statute authorization or the statute or the authorizing statute. The plain text of the proposed rule has to be very easy to read. That's also man federally mandated, so be aware of that. The background on what problems or goals the agency is working on and why it thinks the proposed rule is a good solution, identifies data and other information used in developing the proposed rule, invites everyone to comment on all or just part of the new rule, but more often than not, even if it says to just comment on part of it, you can comment on all of it, 
tells how to submit public comments, and the date when all planned public comments are due by. The opportunity for public comment is step 5.2. Anyone can submit a comment on any part of a rule. This process is not a vote. By law, the federal agency may not choose the final language of the rule based on whether more commenters favor the rule than oppose it, and this happened under the Trump administration with regards to, the part, with regards to new standards set by the Department of Energy, which they ignored. Several thousand different comments which opposed it and went forward and implemented the rule. So just because you have reasons why something shouldn't be made into a new federal regulation or a new federal law, it doesn't mean that the department's going to listen to you. So just be aware of that. It doesn't mean that they're going to listen to any public comment. So be aware of that. And an agency has to use the public comments. They have to review the public comments at the end of this. And they have to look for things such as whether or not the rule makes sense, given the actual facts that people are presenting to them, real world experience, scientific data that's presented, expert opinions. Does it actually address the problem that the agency is trying to solve? Is there a problem with the statute being cited that gives the agency authority in this instance? And would another solution work better? And when you're making a public comment, make sure that you focus on all or some of these points when you're criticizing something. Don't just say that you don't like it, because this is not a voting process. Say whether or say whether or not you like the, whether or not make actual concrete points make legal points use actual data use actual evidence don't just jump to conclusions actually make a concrete principled statement on a matter that's extremely important principled statements step 5.3 the opportunity for more prop process the federal agency may hold public hearings at which people can give their views in person sometimes the authorizing statute requires that they hold such hearings and post them and after the initial public comment period has closed they may ad ad add additional periods to submit reply comments and then if things happen and progress even further there may be even a full second notice and comment phase so just be aware of that then there's step 5.4, which these next two are the most terrifying if you don't like a new regulation. When a federal agency believes that a proposed rule concerns only routine or uncontroversial things, it may try and pivot to directing a final rulemaking decision. If a proposed rule does not get negative comments, the rule will become final shortly after the comment period closes. And in these circumstances, we jump straight to step se 7. And really, step 7 slash step 8, so be aware of that, because at this point, they're going to adopt the rule. So this is the fast track to final. And then this is step 5.5, which is rulemaking without process. Some rules can just become a law without any process or public notification necessary. Rules that can become law immediately include interpretive rules or rules that do not set a new legal standard or where the public commenting is considered impractical. These are called interim final rules. And again, jumps to step seven, it's probably going to get adopted so that it jumps to step eight. We're gonna start now at step six, so we're outside of step five, which is the notice and comment phase, into step six, which is the post comment internal review that all agencies are required to do under the APA. The federal agency has to review all of the comments. It has to check in with other federal agencies that have now been, if there's an agency, agency that they didn't realize would be affected, they now have to recheck in with them or add them onto the docket to have conversations with. And then the rules that have to pass a regular review must return. So rules that have to pass a review also have to go back to the office, to OIRA for another final review. So they go back to the, basically essentially goes back to that office. And then that office goes and consults again with the information they have with the president directly. Step seven is the review outcome. There are three events that can happen based on the outcome of a review. Stop, the rulemaking process ends, it does not become a law. Change, the rulemaking process presumes, and if there are major changes, a new notice and comment process must commence so that the public can react accordingly to the new agency decisions and information. This basically resets the process back to the, st back to the top at step five. Adopt, publish the final rule in the federal register, that must include a statement of basis and purpose, basically all of the information as to why this is allowed, site-specific law, etc., etc. 
Step eight is congressional review. Final rules have to be sent to Congress for a review. Per the Congressional Review Act of 1996, Congress has 60 legislative days to pass a resolution of disapproval, and then the president signs it or veto and override rules take into effect if the president can veto a vote of disapproval. So what is a resolution of disapproval? When a regulation gets sent to Congress for review, if Congress does nothing with it after 60 legislative days, it becomes law. If they do something and it goes to Congress, both houses, have, both chambers of Congress, both the Senate and the House have to say, we don't like this regulation. It goes to the president. The president can either sign and say, okay, this was a horrible decision. I hear you. Or the president can stand by their choice and say, no, we're going to let this play out in the courts. We're going to make this law. Then it goes back and Congress can then decide whether to override or not, which requires, of course, a super majority of Congress to agree that it must be overridden. So be aware of that. Since the Congressional Review Act of 1996, which happened under the Clinton presidency, it has only happened once where a regulation didn't become a law. Back in 2001, under the Bush administration. So it has never worked. Under Obama and Trump, there were many attempts, but given the makeup of Congress and given that there was no clear supermajority on a particular issue, there was never going to be an override for anything that the different department that the different federal agencies and different cabinet level positions were doing in terms of federal regulation. Just be aware of that. Or with undoing federal regulation. Now, oh, and I almost forgot. A legislative day is when Congress is in session. That gets determined by the House and the Senate parliamentarians. A legislative day is not the same as a regular day. So, for example, a legislative day could be three days long from the moment it starts to the moment it ends. That is one legislative day when they finally adjourn. Votorama is a good example of this when everybody was there in the Senate for multiple days at a time. And then, you know, it started and it stopped, but everybody was there. Everyone was still doing active congressional business. That's one day, even though it was three real days. If, and this is under the Congressional Review Act of 1996, 60 days have not passed by the time a new Congress starts at the end of every two years, then 60 extra congressional days or legislative days get added on so that the next Congress can decide whether a regulation stays or not. So you can effectively have about 119 days, legislative days, depending on when things happen, for Congress to be able to reject something, such as a new rule or regulation. Now, under these circumstances, Legislative days during every single congressional cycle change, depending on the emergencies and circumstances. So, for example, in the Obama years, the Trump administration could attempt to get rid of regulations as far back as May, because there weren't that many legislative days in that session. In contrast, because there were so many legislative days in the Trump's in the Trump administration's final months, because of the coronavirus pandemic. Only up until about August and September could any regulations be removed, which is, a, which is a significantly shorter amount of time. So be aware of that. It depends. Judicial review under Marbury versus Madison in 1803, the Supreme Court can set a new precedent that basically says that a new rule is unlawful, and this can even happen in the middle of the rulemaking process. When this happens in the middle of the rulemaking process, that effectively stops it. If we go back, it can stop and the rulemaking process ends because it will not pass and it will not stay up in court. Or it could be changed significantly parts that need to be completely removed. So just be aware of that. Congressional judicial. There's interpretation, enforcement, and reassessment at this point. The rule is law. So this is step 10. Compliance assistance materials are created by the federal agency that is implementing the rule. And the new regulation may be reassessed every few years or when a major event happens, such as a new presidential directive, a new petition from the public, or a court case that modifies existing statute. There are also different statutes that mandate that every so many years a regulation has to be reviewed, updated, or changed. So be aware of that. At this point, it's a law, and the most terrifying prospect of how this works is that while during the comment, the notice and comment phase, you're going to see what the regulation is being proposed as, you won't know 
the specific language until we hit past this point. And it's at this point, basically steps seven through 10, that you will see the full language of what the regulation would do, and you get to see how pervasive or how aggressive it is. You don't really get to see that in the beginning. You don't get to see that in the notice and comment phase, so I just wanna point that out. How to end a regulation. You can only end a regulation with three specific steps. The new administration or a new cabinet member decides to initiate the rulemaking process again and to replace or remove language in the existing regulation, as is their right under the Administration Procedure Act of 1946, the APA. We've been over this. The Supreme Court's power of judicial review under 5 U.S. 137 Marbury v. Madison or Congress passes a new law that would force a change or repeal of an existing or in-process regulation, as is their right under USC Article 1, Section 8 in general. I know several other sections in different articles can get thrown in with Congress on this, but most of their powers are under Article 1, Section 8 as the legislative branch of government, the first branch mentioned. Remember, Article 2 is about the presidency and the executive. Article 3 has to do with the judiciary primarily, so remember that. Regulations carry the force of law, and regulations are law. The next videos that I'm going to do on federal law are going to be on the Elementary Secondary Education Act of 1965 as amended, also known as the ESEA, specifically Title II Part B Subpart 3, 20 U.S.C. 6662 and 20 U.S.C. 6663 because of what's happening right now in the Department of Education with regards to the American History and Civics Education proposed rule. These are the three statutes that are being cited in the new regulation that give the Department of Education the power to enact this. And so we are going to, as quickly as possible, in two, three other videos, go over the what these rules and, law, and what these statutes are, what their rules internally are, their legislative histories, and how that applies to what the Department of Education is doing right now. Hopefully that will be very informative. So I'm going to switch back. I'm going to exit this. And that is it. That is the quick presentation on the federal rulemaking process. I hope that was in I hope that was informational. There are many links in the descriptions so that you can go through and read more information as you will, different FAQs, different pieces of information that I may not have had time to talk about in this video. Like, share, and subscribe if you like this content, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. That is the video. Thank you.